This is Dr. David Proden, and I want to thank you as we begin another journey into school and community safety. If you're looking for industrial safety expert, Appalachian State University professor, Dr. Timothy Ludwig, please visit www.safety-doc.com. Again, that's Dr. Timothy Ludwig at www.safety-doc.com. Welcome to the Safety Doc Podcast with author, radio host, and nationally recognized safety expert, Dr. David Perodin. Join us each week as we discuss the best and most bizarre practices in safety preparation and crisis response. Follow Dr. Perodin on Twitter at SafetyPhD. And remember, the truth will keep you safe. Hi, everyone. This is Dr. David Proden, and welcome to the Safety Doc Podcast. It is a brisk 55 degrees down here in the recording studio, so I have on a zippered hooded sweatshirt for survival. It's cold. Um, A shout out to radio and podcast. Radio and podcast. Check the site out. I am now featured on the lineup, radio and podcast, part of the Jim Mallard Network, the Mallard Show, phenomenal interviews uh, from Jim Mallard. He's had Roger Stone on a few times, but radio and podcast, very glad now to be featured in that lineup. Also, the 405media.com out of Los Angeles, California, featuring the Safety Doc podcast at 2 p.m. PST daily, Monday through Saturday. I believe it's my third year now on the 405 Media out of Los Angeles. A thank you to John Grant and the 405media.com. So the last show where we interviewed Giles from What Three Words um, had a phenomenal turnout very popular show um so incredible information shared about what three words the three word addressing system across the world so i was very appreciative we had two time zones obviously he's working great britain i'm working united states i believe a seven hour difference Uh, but again thank you for your support of that show um was one of my most um heavily downloaded shows in recent history. So, and I am still working on another show with Justin Dooley. Um, we are going to take on the Kids Baking Challenge Network. Um, some injustices that need to be righted in that process. So, we just got through a cold spell. Um, it was minus 33 degrees on my way to work the other morning. That's without wind chill. That's a straight up minus 33 degrees. Now, I'm from Wisconsin, northern Wisconsin. This is southern Wisconsin. That's still very cold. But you know what? Once you live here for your entire life and you get halfway through winter, minus 33 isn't all that different from like zero. So it's not like you go outside and it's like, oh my goodness, this is awful. It didn't feel that bad at all. Um, but yeah, minus 33. So what happens in minus 33, though, is everything sounds, it sounds like your house is cracking apart because the uh, the ice, you know, everything condenses, it's on the roof. So the ice cracks, the ground cracks, and they talk about this on the local uh, TV stations. They're like, if you hear cracking at night, you know, this is what's happening. Nothing to worry about, probably not damaging your house or anything like that, but because it gets so cold, everything condenses and it, it just cracks um so yeah definitely heard it's kind of like a low-grade thunderstorm that just goes on for a couple of days but uh it's warmer now i think it's like zero outside it's gonna be 15 tomorrow i am so ready for spring i hate winter hey today i'm talking about not getting exactly what you want right away we're going to talk about optimal outcomes and suboptimal outcomes and the whole premise of this presentation is that I believe suboptimal outcomes get a bad rap. Um, 
So let's talk first about what is an optimal outcome. This is what we are all conditioned for. This is what every television ad out there has. This was every school, every school leader, laws, whatever, optimal outcomes. So an optimal outcome. So we're going to just frame this optimal decision. An optimal decision is a decision that leads to at least as good a known or expected outcome as all other available decision options. It is an important concept in decision theory. So by deduction, a suboptimal outcome would be lesser than an optimal outcome. Okay, so basically an optimal outcome is like making the best decision right off the start to get you to your outcome. So I have some examples which will clear this up. Now that sounds great, right? The The thing is though, we often don't know what the best decision is to make. So if you make um, multiple decisions that kind of get you to the same outcome, it's like taking, you know, you can take the highway to get to your location or you can take like a, a lot of back roads that you program into your GPS system. And as long as you get to your destination, like, that's your optimal outcome. But if you're taking all these back roads, that would be viewed as suboptimal. Like you're putting more miles on your car, it's taking you longer, um, you know, whatever. Where the optimal be, this is a shorter way, this is better pavement and whatever. So this is, this is optimal. So if you're, if you're, it doesn't matter in this perspective if you get to your destination which I think is garbage, okay? That's where we need to revisit this because this has people's whole mind and economics and everything else, like just, it's it's bad, it's bad. Um, so I think we need to understand how this conflates with, with decision-making. So suboptimal outcome, how this impacts decision-making. As when we are talking about suboptimal outcomes, we're also recognizing that suboptimal decisions were made to arrive at those suboptimal outcomes. This infers that the decision-making process could be tuned, and perhaps this is true, but perhaps these suboptimal decisions were quite brilliant in the presented context and situation. Remember, all decisions are laminated to time, context, and situation. So maybe this day that you chose to go to this destination was a this perfect, sunny, early summer day and you didn't want to be on the interstate where everybody's driving 80 miles an hour and pulling jet skis behind and it's it's noisy and people are weaving in and out and it's high stress maybe you want to take the back roads maybe we'll roll the windows down and you get to see the green fields things kind of greening up you get the the country air um, and it's just beautiful and it's scenic and you get, you know, the wildlife and cranes and stuff like that. I'm just thinking of some of the routes that I choose to take on days like that and just enjoy the journey. But see, that's considered a suboptimal outcome because you could have taken, again, the interstate could have cut down in your time to get somewhere else. Maybe the miles on your vehicle, you trim that down by 10 or 15 miles because you're taking a more direct route. So here's my question. So is it a bad decision to take the, the series of back roads to get to where you need to go on this like sunny late spring day? Well, you know, here's the thing. We laminate everything to context and situation. Maybe it's also relaxing for you. And it's just, you know, it's mentally relaxing. You're surrounding yourself with more green. Um, You can take your own pace. If you want to, you know, pull off um, for a little bit, you can can do that. Um, It's one of those things where I think there are so many benefits that just are realized. But the benefits of... Is this more uh, relaxing for me? Is this just more enjoyable for me to do this drive? That doesn't really count into this sub, this this optimal outcome the, of of variables. It's only like, did you get there? How fast did you get there? And did you get there like in, in the least miles as possible? It ignores everything else. So 
these are the types of things where suboptimal decisions just I there's value in them, but they're not valued. Okay. So and, and I took a lot of notes here, but this is stuff that I wrote. I didn't copy this from somewhere else and bring it forward. Any study will frame suboptimal choice from the deficit perspective. So if you go online right now, jeepers, my armrest. All right. If you go online right now and type in um, suboptimal outcomes in a Google search, all of the studies that show up, all of the definitions are going to put that in a deficit perspective. That, that That's a bad thing. Like here's the studies in suboptimal decision-making in banking and in healthcare and whatever. And the whole objective is to try to get rid of the suboptimal choices, help people get through that. It's called heuristics, knowing what your options are and then choosing the best option or w one of the best to... If you are making choices, you're making as few choices as necessary to get you to your, your outcome. Um, so it's all deficit perspective. I think that's garbage. I think that's, again, I think it's garbage. So whether it be the paradox of suboptimal choice or solving the problem of suboptimal choice. So let's break that down a little bit. Um, Again, as long as you accomplish what you want to accomplish, yes, you can have efficiencies built into the system. Um, you know, like I can take my car and bike over to the neighboring community to get something from a store, you know, like a part or something like that, and, and come back. Or if it's a nice day, I could actually bike it. Um, you know, it's going to take me probably three hours to bike over and back, if not four. But if it's a nice day, that's not a big deal. And I'm also out in the fresh air and my body is benefiting from the exercise and the sun, I'm getting the vitamin D and just so many things out of that. But if you compare the two, the biking is suboptimal, right? It's completely suboptimal from the way that this is framed out of this whole simulated annealing type process, which we'll get into in a little bit. But I think this is wrong. I think people are using the wrong variables in this. And so if you are telling people there's one best way to do things, first of all, like everybody's different. I don't know how you come up with that, but let's say you're telling everybody there's one best way to do things. In some cases, there are just ways to do things. Like if you're going through a toll booth, like there is no really better technique to go through a toll booth. I mean, you pay the toll and you go forward, whether you have the money ready or whether you have it here or whatever. I mean, little things like it doesn't matter. Okay. Because it's still, it's the same process using a vending machine. Okay. Like some of that, like there's always, there's pretty much a suboptimal outcome or um, a, a, an optimal way to do that. You know, it's, it's, but okay. So once you tell people there's an optimal outcome, there's the one way to get from here to here or to accomplish th this task or to, to accomplish whatever in your life, okay? This is, this is what I want to be in life, and you've got one way to get there. One way to get there. Okay, that primes people for one convergent, universally acceptable solution. So let me do that again. That primes people for one convergent, universally acceptable solution. Meaning, so convergent, that again, there's one way to do it. So you're teaching everybody, people are expecting you, here's the one way that you're going to, you know, get your house in life and get your job and, you know, career and whatever. It's convergent. It's, it's this one way. Um, and this is universally accepted. It's this formula. It used to be, what was the formula, right? It was go to college and get your degree and get out and get a job. And uh, I would argue that's a pretty flawed formula. Um, it's, it, it's much better to look at <laughs> these sub, uh, I, I don't even want to call them, I'm going to call them suboptimal choices because technically that's what they are referred to. But I'm just saying, I think it's a, I would say divergent choices, um, meaning that there are many ways to 
get to where you want to go later in life. And I don't, I don't think you're going to know where you really want to go or what you're going to do and all of that until you experience things. So it's like taking a map, you know, and, and you're going to take a vacation and it's all laid out for you. Remember the old days with AAA? Like you could tell them where you want to go and they would send you the maps and everything would be highlighted. It was kind of before the Garmin age. And I mean, so you, you, it was all kind of done for you. There's something different though in doing reconnaissance on your own and learning areas and taking this divergent approach, which would be called suboptimal, right? Because you're probably putting a lot of miles on your car. It's not all that efficient, but really it's massively equipping you to recognize the optimal decisions when they come by you because you have something to compare to. So, um, all right. So not everything is going to be optimal. So, you know, again, it works if you're putting money in a vending machine and making it your selection. Some of those things are just laid out to always be pretty much optimal. It doesn't work when your main road home is washed out by a flood. So your optimal way is I always take this way home. It's the shortest distance and gets me home in 33 minutes. And now it's like there was a flood roads gone. Now you've got to take a whole bunch of back roads. Maybe some of those are washed out. So you got to figure out what your suboptimal choices are going to be in order to get your way home. But ultimately, if you get home, you've accomplished what you set out to do. You've reached that optimal state. Thank you for tuning in to the Safety Doc Podcast with the nation's leading safety expert, Dr. David Perodin. Author, radio show host, university instructor, researcher, expert witness, and consultant. Powerful testimonials. Dr. Perodin has a strong reputation as the go-to safety consultant, and he was still able to exceed our expectations. When we went looking for an expert in the field of crisis preparedness and prevention, David was the single person we pursued. Not easy stepping into the touchier subjects of life, but Dr. David pulls it off. Take a listen. Now, back to Dr. David Perodin and the Safety Doc Podcast. So it's not unlimited? No, it's unlimited, but throttled. Throttled meaning not unlimited? Unlimited, but throttled. People would argue, well, this is it's suboptimal because you had to do all of these other things. Well, well, you didn't have much of a choice. And maybe you made some wrong turns or whatever because you're forced into something now that's unfamiliar. It's kind of outside of your, your Taurus, your comfort zone. Because you didn't take these other routes before. You're not familiar with the landscape. Okay? And because of that, it's mysterious to you. You're not quite sure. So you you got to... You gotta, incrementally work your way through some of these roads to get your way home but you get home right so so i see this overtly in marketing and consumerism it's a condition response at this point if you want this this is what you have to do if you want to be cool at christmas it's what i always think is crazy because i don't know of anyone who's ever done this but where they have the commercial where you know the the couple you know husband or wife or Whichever one peeks out the window and it's like, oh my goodness, there's two brand new vehicles out there with big bows on them. And, you know, how great this is and and all this other stuff. You know, that's marketing and consumerism. This is what this is, that you have to have this if you want to be happy and if you want to fit in and all this other stuff. That's, you know, it's, it doesn't make any, it's garbage, right? I'm using garbage a lot, but that doesn't make sense. Things don't make you happy, okay? And it's marketing consumerism i see this i mean it's all the time right that's just what commercials are they're trying to get you to identify that a product or a service is the only optimal way to get to whatever outcome it is you know that so um we're built around this and and so we're not encouraged to do anything with suboptimal outcomes it is all um, optimal outcomes, you know, like the optimal outcome of you are, you know, all all of the advertisements for athletic gyms, you know, go to the gym, going to the gym is great. Came and especially, you know, in Wisconsin, when your outdoor stuff is kind of limited, but going to the gym 
also pairs with going out running at night and doing some other things outdoors. So it's it's there are some um, divergent ways to get yourself in shape versus the convergent thing of like going on the one machine. There are more ways to get in shape than the one fitness machine which is advertised on TV, right? So we are conditioned to not only reach an optimal outcome, but then climb up to the fanciest tier of that outcome. Let's talk about buying a car. So author and economist Aaron Clary makes this point in his book, Poor Richard's Retirement. And he also talks about this in his podcast. When he mentions the utility of a vehicle, he talks about his own purchase of replacing his vehicles and buying used vehicles that are in good shape, low mileage, they have some years on them, and all of the depreciation largely is off of the vehicle and things that are fairly still easy to fix, although that is becoming harder and harder as vehicles become um, with, it, encased with more electronics. Um, it's not the days of, of being able to pull out the ratchet set and whip, whip out the spark plugs and change them out and and do all of that stuff on your own. It's getting a little bit harder the way they put these things together. But let's go back to uh, Aaron Clary and Poor Richard's Retirement. He also wrote he wrote several books. One is Reconnaissance Man, which I did a review on, and I encourage you to, to read that. That definitely identifies a path of suboptimal decision-making to then get to the point where you understand what is your optimal decision. The example there is saying, check out the United States. Take some months, you know, when you're 18 or 19 years old, drive around to um, New Mexico, to Colorado, to Utah, you know, to different states. Um, Spend time in, you know, South Dakota and figure out what you like, areas that you like, places that you like, and what do you like to do? If you like to hike and bike, you know, Minnesota, you're not going to be doing that from November to probably April 1st because it's going to be snowy and icy and cold and nobody wants to be out biking during that. But, you know, if you're living down in um, Las Vegas or uh, northern Arizona, things like that, you've got some options available to you. So what he gets at, and it makes a lot of sense, is... These whole things of optimal outcomes, that's all prescribed for you by other people. And we're just in this society now where it's just telling people what to do. Remember the whole thing of go to college, like it's going, you'll have a great outcome, pick up whatever degree that you want, and this job will be waiting for you and you'll reach happiness and the home ownership and vehicle, whatever it is that I guess reaches this optimal outcome. No, not true. And the suboptimal outcomes, the suboptimal decision making, the exploration, the reconnaissance that Aaron Clary talks about is what allows you to identify, hey, I like this more than I like this. And, you know, I tend to be a person that likes outdoors. Or, you know, for some reason, if you're a person that really likes uh, snowmobiling and, and whatever, then, you know, maybe Wisconsin or Minnesota is for you. But to evaluate different options and then Figure out where those fit in your life plan. And you're not committed to live somewhere your entire life too, but once you set down roots, you're you're typically there for, you know, 10, 20 years. So follow the flow chart over um, personal reconnaissance. This is what we're told to do. You know, things are prescribed to you. Again, go to this university, get this degree, get this life pattern. Doesn't work that way. What we end up is um, we end up with virtual field trips when we when we start programming kids into that. We end up with high school kids that don't go to D.C. because they're told it's too dangerous um, or it's just a it's a, not a clean city and, you know, they could be taken advantage of. So they end up with virtual field trips, putting on the virtual field trip goggles and having someone else's positionality tell them this is your optimal outcome. We will... Go first, you know, I'll show you the Washington 
monument and then we'll go to the Lincoln Memorial and all it's all virtual it's it's so you have none of the experience of of sweating out in the sun or gun a gum not a gun but gum on a sidewalk um and and just seeing this whole scope of these these things and the other people there so you lose out on this personal reconnaissance when you're following this flow chart of these are the optimal outcomes that you have to make. So an optimal choice is largely accepted as the best choice in studies. Okay. The optimal choice. Now, again, you want to work through this pretty fast. I mean, if, if you're a firefighter and you, you come upon a fire, you have to evaluate it pretty quickly and make what would be hopefully an optimal choice of your approach to counter that fire. I mean, there are circumstances where this does make sense, but there's other circumstances when it doesn't make sense. Remember we talked about that ride on a nice sunny late spring day. So we tend to seek optimal choices, which make sense from an efficiency standpoint, but life is rarely efficient and we rarely can control for all the injects or curveballs we have to deal with. For example, I drove on the interstate on my way back from work and was involved in a multi-vehicle accident, which destroyed my vehicle. Now, um, had I not been on the interstate and on a less traveled road, um, that might not have happened because literally, you know, the interstate, you have much more traffic and you don't have the options of taking the ditch because you have railings on both sides of you. So, um, these types of things where, you know, these injects and, and curveballs um, th- that come into these efficient machines, um, it's just like if you upgrade to a brand new computer system, everything's you know, you think state of the art or whatever, but then there's little glitches in the software, or things that you had that aren't quite compatible, and they're coming out with patches and stuff like that. It's kind of why I still use Windows 7 and know other people that use that too. It's because people who have upgraded have found that just because it's allegedly a more optimal system doesn't mean it's free of curveballs or problems. Um, I put, but some insufficiently informed decision-making is not the same as suboptimal choice. So I want to make that clear. If you, okay, if I'm going out, um, and I am going to buy a pair of, um, I'm going to, I'm going to buy a, a pair of gloves. Okay. Like for out outside, you know, for using my, you know, weed whacker and, and, and power equipment and stuff like that. So I want to be informed of the decision-making. I don't want, I don't want to just buy a cheap pair of gloves necessarily. I want to buy a pair of gloves that have a good rating that are going to be pretty durable, that are going to hold up. Um, if, you know, there is a, a you know, they have some abrasion resistance if there's a blade or something that slips. So you have to be informed when you're making decisions. So all of it, you have to have information, you know, when you're making your decisions. And again, that's not the same as making a suboptimal choice. Let me, let me clear that. So, you know, it is, it is definitely knowing, for example, if you're Um, again, let's use this example of your road washes out that you usually take. So you want to make informed decisions on your next path out of there. So you try to get information through, you know, you can go online, um, in, in, you know, or through your phone to try to learn of other roads that have been also washed out or have been compromised. So you don't want to go down um, you know, roads that aren't going to, to be safe. So you're going to try to get information saying, okay, I've learned that this road, which is further out is, is intact. It's safe here. I'm looking, I brought it, the map up from the state maps. It's reported as being in good condition. That's the one I'm going to take. So you've informed yourself to making that decision. So, um, 
informed decision making is not the same as a suboptimal choice. So let me give an example. Agreeing to a car lease plan and then going 20,000 miles of over your mileage allowance is not any form of suboptimal decision. Okay, so you might have made this decision that I'm going to lease this car because it's going to keep more money in the bank for me and I'm trying to save up for a down payment on a house or something and whatever reasons you have that you're you're going with this lease. Or maybe that, you know, I might be moving out of the country and I don't want to com- commit to then trying to sell a vehicle or something like that. Whatever, okay. But if you've agreed to this car lease and you're not informed of the lease, how many times do we see these things with people? I didn't know taking out a student loan that I had to pay it back, right? Come on. Or I didn't know what interest was and, you know, I was I was taken advantage of. Oh, come on. You are not taken advantage of. I mean, since we've been little, we understand what money is. All kids have the concept of what money is. You need to be informed, and if you're not informed, that's ignorance. So on this car lease plan, I knew somebody that did this, by the way. If you are not informed, if you haven't if you haven't sought out the information, if you're underinformed in that decision, then that's your own fault. That's not a suboptimal decision, okay? Um, it's just a bad decision where you're underinformed. So, um, but in this case, you know, like a sub suboptimal decision is saying, you know, did it make more sense to lease this car or to maybe buy a car, you know, for $5,000 that was 10 years old and had 60,000 miles on it. Like what made more sense, you know, doing the lease on this car or like buying the other car? Because when the, sure, you you balance it out. So the lease, maybe you you have some maintenance thrown in there, but on this other car, when it's all done, maybe you can get something back out of it. So, you know, you can, you can kind of weigh things. So those are two kind of areas where you'd have to decide if it's a suboptimal decision or not to, to make that car lease versus buying like a used car. But if, again, if you're doing this car lease and you're, you have no idea that, oh my goodness, I can only put on so many miles and then I get charged for every mile afterwards. So this lease ends up costing me double what I thought it was going to. And now I have nothing to show for it. The vehicle's gone and I have all this out of pocket money I have to put forward. That's uninformed. That's not suboptimal. That's just stupid is what that is. So again, it's the same thing with these student um, loans. My goodness. So I was watching these documentaries where they have students, you know, they, they go on campus. I remember this when I went to school. And by that time, you know, like I stayed in a, a the cheapest dorm. This was when I was picking up my administrative degree. So I had to be like maybe late 20s close to 30 when I was doing this and uh cheapest dorm in the summer they were renovating it and it was like borderline even livable so it was just like I think actually they gave it to us for free like anyone who was willing to stay there um because it was just so noisy and horrendous but I didn't care like I was again it was my optimal outcome because I was on campus and I was literally across the street from the building where most of my classes were so it was fine. Like it was a roof over my head. Um, I had a, you know, a bed down the hall was the bathroom. It was an optimal outcome. Now, could I have stayed at a high end dorm or like some people stayed at a hotel, you know, like a few blocks away, they stayed at a hotel. I'm like, what in the world is that all about? Like for the summer? You know, I suppose you can work out long-term deals, um, and, and do that, but why? Like it's all I need. And here's the other thing that I did is I signed up for net zero back then, which was free internet, but I had to dial over to Duluth. I was in superior, but I could get it for free. And that was a short, there was no distance, long distance on that call. And it would always put these ads up around the sides of the screen. And every once in a while you had to click on one to keep your internet, but 
It was back before the university had internet provided to everybody. Um, but it was a brilliant move, even though he had all these annoying ads. Like, I got the internet. I was able to do what I wanted to do. Versus, like, other people who were buying, like, whatever plan, like a Verizon plan or something like that for 30 bucks for a month. I'm like, I get this for free. Yeah, it's a little annoying to have the ads, but from a utility perspective, this is great. This is an optimal outcome. We are both on the net. We both can access the same sites, do the same research, whatever. If you have a vehicle and you can take that vehicle and go from point A to point B, once you get to point B, you've reached your optimal outcome. Whether that vehicle is a $3,000 Kia or a, an $80,000 BMW, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It, it, it does not matter at all. But we're convinced that the BMW is the optimal outcome because it's more responsive and it's a you know faster drive and, and better stereo and better suspension, all that. But yeah, it, those are all niceties. It doesn't matter. You still have a vehicle to get you from point A to point B, which is your B is your optimal outcome and it gets you there. And now you have all of the money that you would have thrown away on this BMW, which someone might dent up or steal or whatever anyway. And it's a vehicle, things we didn't even have 200 years ago. So, I mean, the luxuries, you know, when people look at these things and they'd be like, oh my goodness. But this is where we get always sold up. We get sold up. People try to, to convince us you have to have the better house. You have to have the be- bigger house, the better house, the better clothes and all of this stuff. I'm like, that's garbage. It doesn't matter. Like I literally have shirts that I wear um, in winter that I've worn for the last 20 years. And, uh, you know, like my, my pea coat, my Navy pea coat has got to be like, you know, it's <laughs> 15, 20 years and then it just gets dry clean. And I use it again. I mean, it's like you do not need to step up on these things. My lawnmower, you know, maybe 15 years old and then I service it and it goes for another year. I don't need the new model lawnmower. Yeah, does it have a couple features that maybe the bagger is a better setup than whoever came up with the weird design? Yeah, I don't use the bagger a lot though, and it's okay for when I need it. Um, yeah, obviously, are the new ones designed a little better? Yeah, but it's a mower, it mows the lawn. If you have a sharp blade on a mower, you're pretty much set, right? So I don't need the latest in mowing technology. Um, I'm good. I'm good. And I'm not inferior because my neighbor's got the new mower and we're mowing out together. And I'm looking over saying, boy, if I only had that model, this would be such a better experience for me. I'm like, it doesn't matter. We still have the same optimal. At the end of the day, our lawns look virtually the same. I think mine probably looks a little better because I always cut some patterns into it. So it looks like the outfield at a baseball stadium. That's just a little extra time I put in because I just kind of like being outside. But it doesn't matter. What is it in that Bill Murray meatballs? It just doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. Was it Camp Mohawk? If they have all of the things and the personal masseuse, it just doesn't matter. That's good. Check that out. Bill Murray. I think it's 1979. Could have been 78. He was a camp counselor. Um, but there's a lot to be learned about suboptimal outcomes and optimal outcomes, actually, from watching that movie, kind of with that in mind. So let me move on here. So summer vacation. In Duluth, Minnesota, we go to Canal Park. So here, here, here's what I do: is I put together the plan for the day, and I'll be like, "Okay, here's what here's what we're gonna do for the day." Um, I know there's some variability in this, so like there's a there's a bridge actually, that little lift bridge, and if that thing is up, that can throw off your whole schedule. Being able to kind of navigate around Canal Park, you gotta wait for that thing to come down. So it could be like 10, 15 minutes, and Stuff like that. But anyway, um, so here's my optimal plan. You, I, you buy the tickets for the 10 a.m. Harbor Sightseeing Cruise. Okay, I can do that online. Or I can do it in person. doesn't matter. But get the tickets. So 10 a.m., we're out. I know the cruise will be back by about noon. Then we can go to Famous Dave's, which is close by, down there by Canal Park in uh, Duluth. It's, it's a pretty 
fabulous place. Check it out online. But you go to Famous Dave's. Don't go there often, but I do like it. Um, grab something to eat, and then we can drive back to the hotel, which is going to be in Superior. Why Superior? Because it's cheaper. It's cheaper to stay in Superior, which is right across the bridge. It's a five-minute drive than it is to stay down in Duluth by Canal Park. So it's much, much cheaper to stay in Superior. And it's cheaper to eat in Superior. So Superior is more of a depressed area. Duluth isn't. So I just skip across the bridge, stay in Superior. Not a big thing for me. Um, again, it's it's a place. The kids, you know, stay somewhere. The kids have a pool. And, you know, if we can, we can get a breakfast thrown in there, I'm all for it. I don't need to be looking out onto the harbor to see the thousand foot freighters come in at any hour of the day. I can get my fill of that when I'm down at Canal Park. I know when the boats are coming in, I can check the schedule. So we, uh, so here's my, that's my schedule. We, we get back to the hotel. Kids have some time in the pool. I can check the internet if I want and just kind of hang out. Um, eat at Perkins or, you know, one of the, the family restaurants. Again, in Superior, cheaper than Duluth. We go at night to Duluth Huskies game, buy the cheap tickets because it's never sold out. It's historic Wade Stadium. It's a pretty awesome place. And as soon as you go in, you can just sit anywhere you want anyway. So, um, and literally, I mean, so it's like minor league baseball in an old park. Um, so you can take the whole family for like 30 bucks. But it's dangerous parking if you don't exactly know what you're doing because if you kind of go up this hill and park... That's where I took off the front of my dad's Equinox a couple of years ago, um, which I thought would have cleared the area that we were driving over, and it didn't, so it ripped the front fascia off, which I taped up with some very strong tape then. Uh, we stopped at a Walmart, and um, he took it to an auto place, and they, they fixed it cheap. I don't know. It was like under 100 bucks. They reattached it. You can't tell. But yeah, so Duluth Husky. So that's that's the thing, you know. Um, so that's my that's my that's my day. Now, if that gets that's my optimal optimal plan. Now, if if that gets messed up and I, I've got to switch things around because you know the husky, it's going to rain, so we're not we can't do the Huskies game. So then maybe you know I can I can move something else into that spot. Maybe we swim later. Maybe we do something else in the afternoon, like hang out and watch the boats a little more, do the aquarium, um, do like there's some other sightseeing you can walk along um, in in Duluth right along the Lake Superior. So you can mix some of these things up. So. You know, those can be your suboptimals if if some of your optimals are gone, you know, like the baseball game. So, or if the harbor thing is filled up, then yeah, then we do something else and then we adjust. But ultimately, it's like you have to be willing to go with your suboptimals. And so you put your optimal plan together and you, you adjust. Um, but usually, you know, things like that work. So think, think about this as a cross-country flight. So you book a direct nonstop flight awesome, right? You get on the plane, you're going to end up at your destination. Then something happens. Maybe it's a weather system. Flights are getting canceled everywhere. And, um, and now you're in the process of what's known as simulated annealing. Okay. Simulated annealing is working the problem. So no longer are you going from Chicago to Los Angeles. Like that's gone. That's gone. You don't have that flight available to you anymore. So this working the problem or this whole Apollo 13 approach, Okay, which is basically figuring out your suboptimal outcome. So you look and you say, well, I can I can fly now from Chicago to Dallas. I can go from Dallas and I can fly up to Bakersfield. From Bakersfield, I can get a bus, which a Greyhound bus will get me down to LA. Okay, so like those are a whole bunch of suboptimal outcomes that still get you to your optimal outcome. Your destination of Los Angeles. Why you'd want to go there, I don't know. But I'm just saying for this example. Um, that works, okay? You've just worked the problem through suboptimal outcomes. But unless you've done reconnaissance, unless you're used to that, and, and 
understanding that there are divergent ways to get to an outcome. And maybe there's something you're going to discover with this flight to Dallas or whatever. It's like, you know what? I kind of like this. Maybe this is, I'm going to look at this when I'm planning because, you know, if you plan flights and they have multiple stops in them, um, they're cheaper, right? In different times of day that you're doing this. And if time doesn't, isn't a huge factor for you, you can save the money and still get to your outcome. If time is, is of, you know, it's really important. I mean, if you're traveling with a whole family, yeah, I want to cut down the wait time because I know that's just not going to settle well with having your family at the airport. If it's just me for business or something like that, it's a few hours one way or another. It doesn't matter to me if I can shave some dollars off of that. So it's not like they give you the bad airplane from Dallas up to Bakersfield or something like that, right? An airplane's an airplane, kind of like we we're talking about the cars. This whole thing, too, with um, suboptimal outcomes and optimal. I think suboptimal outcomes also play into delayed gratification and a delayed reward system, meaning you know, you're willing to go through more to get to where you, you want to be in life. Um, for example, like you know, working several part-time jobs to save up um, instead of maybe taking out big loans. So, you know... You can come, or, or let's say if you're going into the military, and then, you know, I have a good friend that did that, went into the military and came out, took his GI Bill, you know, got trained in computers and became a coding specialist and did very well for himself, zero debt. Um, so, again, these whole things of delaying gratification. So, in his case, it was delaying going um, to college and racking up the loans. Uh, but getting out four years earlier, but he went and he got real life experience in the Navy. And so he got to do a lot of cool things. And he stayed in the Navy reserves after a while and, and found he liked that. And it built up uh, an additional retirement source for him and some additional income. So he's positioned really well now because he chose delayed gratification and some of these suboptimal outcomes. He also got to see places he never would have got to see if he would have just picked out the one college. And he's like, I'd really like to go back to like here and here and here and here, which were ports that he stopped at when he was in the, in the Navy. So in studies with pigeons, researchers found that pigeons that had been denied food tended to make suboptimal choices compared to control groups that had access to food. So that seems like very obvious and stupid, right? So... This is really just adding stress and moving the pigeons to the crust of their torus. I mean, if you're not feeding the pigeons, you got two control groups, you got one group of pigeons that's hungry, yeah, they're going to eat anything you, you throw their way. Stale bread, Skittles, you know, a piece of pizza, whatever. They're going to go for it. Is it. It's a suboptimal choice. They're going to make a suboptimal choice if they're hungry because they're they're not going to wait it out until, you know, the they can get to fly another 20 miles or whatever to the location where the berries are that are really good for them. It's like you do what you got to do. You got, you know, you got to eat or die. But this whole thing, this this was a study that was all framed out as this is suboptimal. When these pigeons get hungry, they make suboptimal choices, which then just don't give them the nourishment. It's just not good for them long term. Well, yeah, I get it. Maybe that fits in with delayed gratification. But what do you expect them to do? They're pigeons. And at some time with people, you have to make suboptimal outcomes. It's like in Lessons of Lower Manhattan. When So in, in my book, though, which is School of Errors, but talked about Lessons of Lower Manhattan, or from Lower Manhattan, 9-11, the harbor rescue, 500,000 people in nine hours. You had to get off of Manhattan. You had to go down to Battery Park and get out of there because you didn't know. I mean, the towers had collapsed. If it was still ongoing, you would need it to get out of there. So if you need to go somewhere um, it, over New Jersey, maybe you got to take a boat that's going to Hoboken. That's a suboptimal outcome. It gets you off the island, right? But Hoboken's not where you want to be. But it's better than where you were. And then from Hoboken, you got to figure out your way home. Okay, so, you know, if it's new work or whatever, da-da-da-da-da, I can take this or I can, yeah get on, get on a bus or I can have, you know, I do have, I have to figure out now what my other options are. 
So I'm probably going to be making some more suboptimal outcomes to get to where I need to go, but I'm going to get there. But that's this whole thing of we look at if the, the study like this, see, this is what frames out of, of saying if we make choices that, um, you know, like a, a pigeon eating a potato chip or something like that, it's bad for it. Pigeon's going to have high cholesterol, bad for its arteries. Yeah, the pigeon's starving. It needs to eat. And it gives enough calories to then move on. And it probably is going to go back to like the food that it likes and things when it actually has stuff provided to it. So to say something like, you know, when, when it's stressed or it doesn't have the resources to make a suboptimal outcome, it's more survival. I think anybody would do that. But it doesn't mean then that person's going to always be patterned. And I guess maybe there's some lesson in this of should the pigeon, pigeons have held out longer waiting for like the good food? And maybe that's something with people that, you know, that, you know, do you, do you wait out longer for the better job offer instead of taking a job where you're going to, you know, move somewhere for two years, which you know you're not going to stay there and you get to move somewhere else than waiting for a job in a location where maybe if you buy a place, you can stay there um, because there's going to be more opportunities within an area that you can just kind of switch jobs. I don't know. I'm just saying it's kind of goofy. So safety drill. School safety is not about suboptimal outcomes. Safety drills, situational awareness and exercising discretion for the presented context and situation versus a linear predicted move from point A to point B or point K or whatever. So school safety is, they don't teach suboptimal outcomes in school safety. It's, it's very linear of saying, when you have a, a fire drill, you go down this hallway and out this exit, Okay. So, but what if that exit is blocked or what if that there's a fire there? Then what do you do? You have to weigh your sub, your other decisions. Okay. It's, it's suboptimal outcome, suboptimal decisions. This is the way you're supposed to do it. But if you don't do it, then you got to do it another way. But that's not the way handbooks are done. That's not the way drills are done in anything. It's always like there's one convergent way to do things. It's flawed thinking. It's horrible thinking. It's deadly thinking. So you examine outcomes by examining process. People always mess this up. Always mess this up. This is what I work on in consulting. People don't understand this very well, and I rarely see this in practice. What happens is that most people are binary on the outcome. Thumbs up or thumbs down. Good outcome, not a good outcome. Okay. I care more, personally, about studying the process that led to the outcome over the actual outcome, as improving process will improve outcome. For example... If you are um, running um, a, a, a bomb a bomb threat simulation in a school, okay, you can look at the outcomes of how long did it take students to get out of the building, um, how long did it take to notify parents, uh, maybe you know whatever things like that that you actually want to objectively measure. Okay, I guess you know that's okay. What's more important is to understand your process of making decisions during that drill. Like what happened if a student was unwilling to leave the building because they weren't going to go without their backpack? So are you going to drag them out of the building? Are you going to let them go out with their backpack? How are you going to handle that? Kind of all of these weird things that are going to happen. What if like your evacuation zone Suddenly police and fire there and they're like, you got to get four blocks away. And you're like, well, we typically go two blocks away to like this parking lot. We stage there and they're like, you can't, that's not your rally point. It's all within the perimeter. Now you got to move. So this whole thing is like you examine process um, through understanding or you examine process. And if you can improve your process, understand your options process by studying process, the system of process, you'll always improve your outcomes. It makes it less personal too. If you do outcomes, you usually end up blaming somebody. It's Bill's fault, Carol's fault, whatever. No, you look at the system and then it becomes much more divergent. You just say, hey, at this point we made this decision. What other decisions were on the table? What other suboptimal decisions, I guess, were on the table? But ultimately, if everybody gets out safe, you've reached your outcome, your optimal outcome. It's not going to be as easy always as A to B. Uh, let me wrap this up. School evacuation. An initial rally point might be sufficient, but let's say the evacuation is due to a fire that's near the school. Harmful fumes are spewing out of a building 
and they might be blowing toward this rally point. Suddenly, fire and rescue um, says, you got to move. You can't be here at this rally point anymore. We're pushing out the perimeter. So you're pushed out another half mile to an area like you've never thought about of staging any buildings in this area, what you're going to do. But police, fire, law enforcement, they'll work that out with you. They'll be like, here's your point. We already talked about what three words can be used to identify the exact um, rally point in the moment, working the problem, getting it out to parents for unification, all of that. That that can be easily done. Um, But again, you know, so is it, it... each of these relocations would represent a suboptimal outcome. So you first go to a rally point, then they're telling you, no, you got to go like to another one. Maybe you got to go to another one. It always happens like in hurricanes, right? So they evacuate you so far north, and then they'll be like, nope, you got to keep going because it's still like moving inland. Some people, I knew someone in Hurricane Katrina who ended up doing this. Like had, had like four times they had to pack up and then like move further north and further north and further north. So each one of those is kind of like a suboptimal outcome that's changed by the context and situation. Like the storm changes, the hurricane Katrina changes and you respond to it. But ultimately you get to your optimal outcome, which is out of harm's way of the hurricane and you're okay. But then people be like, well, you should have gone there like right away from the start. Well, you didn't know. Like it was dynamic, the situation. Like I didn't know who knew. So the thing is folks, like suboptimal outcomes or suboptimal decisions are viewed negatively. And this is, this is a big mistake. We give it a bad rap. It is just identifying and experimenting with what is out there with you. It's reconnaissance. It's very much needed. It's the kind of thing that's going to keep you from being very linear. And for example, going to college and getting into some program and getting some degree that is, is not going to bring you an outcome of viability in the workforce because maybe you've just got into this because you're college and a degree, but you're not informed. You haven't done the research of what do people actually make in this field. You haven't taken time to intern or meet with some people that do these types of careers or that whole thing with like driving. You know, like when I drove to Orlando a few years ago with my family down to Disney, I wanted to go through some areas like Paducah, Kentucky, and certain certain things I wanted to see. Um, so it wasn't the most efficient route. It was still pretty efficient, but it could have been more efficient. Like we could have trimmed some time off of it. But what I what I gave up was, or I traded out some reconnaissance and getting off of some of the interstates and getting on some of the the roads where I could, I could control my own, you know, pace and we could pull off a a little bit and, and just kind of take in, um, you know, the, the local flair a little bit. So there's nothing wrong with that because we still arrived at Disney, you know, maybe two hours later than what we were going to arrive there anyway. And it didn't matter because the first day we got there, we just, we knew we'd get there early afternoon and kind of unpack our stuff do a little reconnaissance around like our resort area. And then we had a reservation later that night to, to eat. And so, but again, we give suboptimal outcomes a bad rap. And I'll go back to this whole consumerism of, you know, getting caught up in, you have to have whatever type of vehicle or clothes or whatever. And it's like, you don't No, you don't. Um, and you'd be much better off. You'd have have much more control over your life, and you wouldn't be captive to maintaining these things. And like you know, this eighty thousand dollar vehicle versus a four thousand dollar vehicle, which is still going to get you to the same place, the same outcome. So, but we don't teach people this, right? We teach people more and more that it's one way. You have one way to do things. One optimal decision, one optimal outcome. No, you can get to your outcome by taking many different decisions, being very divergent to get there. And that's really going to make you better because you're going to have a broader knowledge base, a broader reconnaissance. This is Dr. David Proden, the Safety Doc, signing out. Again, check me out on radio and podcasts glad to be featured in their lineup take care everybody
This has been the Safety Doc Podcast with author, radio show host, and leading safety expert, Dr. David Perodin. Remember to check back each week for the latest, best, and most bizarre practices in safety preparation and crisis response. You can find Dr. Perodin on Twitter at SafetyPhD. And remember, the truth will keep you safe.